بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لیڈیز اینڈ جنٹلمن السلام علیکم مائی نیم از ڈاکٹر نادر علی سید آئی ایم اے فیکلٹی ممبر ایٹ دی آ خان یونیورسٹی اینڈ ایز کنوینر اف دی اسپیشل لیکچر سیریز آئی ہیو سم ٹاسکس ٹو ڈو دی فرسٹ ٹاسک از ٹو آسک آل اف یو ٹو کائنڈلی ٹیک آؤٹ یور موبائل فونز اینڈ آئی جسٹ سوئچ دیم آف اور ٹرن دیم ٹو وائبریشن موڈ سو وی گوئنگ ٹو ٹیک 20 سیکنڈز جسٹ ٹو ڈو دیٹ Thank you. I will now request the president of the Aachan University, Mr. Firoz Rasool, to come up to the podium and introduce the speaker, Mr. Firoz Rasool. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The chairman and members of the board of trustees. Ms. Karen Armstrong, our distinguished speaker for today's lecture. Dr. David Taylor, acting provost. Dr. Nader Ali Sayed, the convener of the AKU special lecture series. Representatives of the diplomatic community, members of the media, the faculty, staff, students, and alumni of the university, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. I would like to welcome you today to the Aga Khan University Special Lecture Series. And I also include in my welcome members of the audience who are joining us today by video links from other parts of this university. As you can see, this is a very popular event, and unfortunately, we could not accommodate everybody in this particular auditorium. And there are people in various halls and lecture theaters who are joining us today and I hope that they feel equally part of this as we do. The Aga Khan University Special Lecture Series was started six years ago to create a broad-based learning experience for our students. This series has developed into an intellectual forum that attracts wide interest and helps bring to this city contemporary th thinking and pluralist views. We have been fortunate to have had several prominent speakers address us on a diverse range of subjects. And the speakers have included His Royal Highness Prince Hassan of Jordan, Professor Stanley Walport, the historian and author of Jinnah of Pakistan, Sir John Tusa, the director of the Barbican Center in London, Dr. Harun Ahmad, a master of Corpus Christi College, Cambridge University, the Right Honorable Donald McKinnon, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, to name a few. Our speaker for today's presentation is an internationally acclaimed and renowned intellectual force. We are deeply honored and privileged to have Karen Armstrong at the AKU. Her presentation comes at an important time as there is a dire need for greater understanding of the rich diversity of peoples and their beliefs, histories, traditions, and customs in today's interconnected and interdependent world. As a university, we have a responsibility to contribute to the thinking and the actions that help foster understanding between religions, civilizations, and cultures. Karen Armstrong is a prolific writer and a much sought after commentator on religions, 
and the impact of history and geography on people's beliefs and practices. She has, through her television work, interviews, and books, strived to look at the intricacies of world religions rather than painting them with a broad brush. She has described the richness and complexity of religions such as Islam and has forced individuals to rethink one-dimensional views that can lead to mistrust and misunderstanding. She has voiced the importance of tolerance and has challenged misinformed viewpoints that have the potential to fuel misunderstandings between religions and peoples and that add to the degradation of relationships. The Chancellor of this university, His Highness the Aga Khan, has referred to the current dynamics between the West and the Muslim world as a clash of ignorance uh, rather than a clash of civilizations. Outlining Carol, uh, Karen Armstrong's accomplishments would take more than the time we have allocated to her for her speech. So, while I will not go through all her achievements, I believe it would be important to mention that Ms. Armstrong has been invited to address members of the, of the United States Congress on three occasions, has participated in the World Economic Forum in New York and Davos, and was one of the three scholars invited to speak at the United Nations in the first session ever devoted to religion. She has been recently appointed to the United Nations Initiative of the Alliance of Civilizations, and Karen Armstrong provides a more pluralistic view of religions and creates the opportunity for a constructive interfaith dialogue, which is much needed today in our world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with immense delight that I invite Karen Armstrong to deliver her presentation in our special lecture series. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and a delight to be here. Um, I am amazed by your beautiful campus and still more um, astonished by your very warm welcome and generous welcome and hospitality to me. Um, and it's, of course, uh, very important to me to be here with you in Pakistan, which is so much at the center of uh, so much turbulence and trouble and distress in the world today. We are in, a, I wanted to talk today about what religion is, because sadly, religion has been implicated in some of the recent catastrophes of our time. And I've lost count of the number of taxi drivers in London who, when I jump into their cab, and they ask me what I do for a living, uh, tell me uh, that religion has been the major cause of every single war in history. And I have the choice of sighing wearily and retreating into myself, or else trying to explain that that is not so. I don't think it's so today. I think a lot of, the, of what we're seeing uh, that is, is, is so dastardly in the abuse of religion is politically rather than religiously based. But we need to understand what religion is. And often in the Western world, Islam, for example, is said to be not a good religion, a bad religion, um, from people who know absolutely nothing about it, I may say. So I wanted to talk today uh, about the beginnings of religion. Uh, and I wanted to show how Islam is absolutely there uh, in the center of these major religious concerns. Um, I'm going back uh, to a period that, that's known as the Axial Age. Um, it, the term was coined by the German philosopher Karl Jaspers in the middle of the 20th century uh, because he said this period from 900 to 200 BCE was the axis or the pivot around which the whole spiritual history of humanity uh, has continued to revolve. Uh, we've never gone beyond these seminal insights. This was the period of the sages of the Upanishads, of the Buddha, of Confucius, of Laozi, um, of Socrates, uh, the great Greek tragedians, um, and the prophets of Israel. 
uh, in four distinct regions of the world, in China, uh, India, Israel, and in Greece, the traditions that have continued to nourish humanity either came into being or had their roots. So later, rabbinic Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, both brought to fruition the axial age that had developed in monotheistic Israel, um, at, uh, but which got truncated early. And these later traditions, uh, rabbinic Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, completed this, uh, this process. And what was, uh, is astonishing is the profound similarity of these extraordinary traditions. Um, even though they were working in isolation from one another and had, until the end of the period, this period, no contact, they all came up with remarkably similar ideas, which showed that they were, um, they tapped into something very important about the structure of our humanity. This is the way uh, human beings work. And these sages were, were very, very pragmatic. Uh, in their view. If, if, if a, a religious idea that they were promoting uh, didn't work for them, if it didn't bring them a sense of insight and enlightenment, that they weren't interested in it, uh, they, no matter how ideologically sound it might, it might have been. But this uh, is not to be a purely antiquarian pursuit. When I was researching uh, this, uh, the, this period, I was astonished by how contemporary these thinkers were. Sometimes they seemed to be talking directly to us in our situation, because as I hope up to be able to show, they were living in a world and facing problems not dissimilar to our own. They were all, for example, all these regions, engulfed in violence as never before. Um, and of course, the violence was pitiful compared with what we're facing at present. But nevertheless, in the context of that time, it was a shocking advance. Iron weaponry had been uh, uh, introduced, for example, and that made wars far more deadly. Um, centralized large states and empires were developing, which depended upon coercion and military power in a way that had not been possible before. Um, Market economies were developing in all these regions. Trade and industry was developing, again, on a minor scale compared with what we have today. Uh, but, uh, but still, uh, and, and it's important to, th to be clear about this, religion did not develop in lonely hillsides on mountain tops or mountain caves or in the depths of the desert. Th these religions developed in the cities uh, in, uh, a in a context of cutthroat capitalism, albeit infantile, primitive, primitive market economies, but nevertheless, a more aggressive economy was developing with merchants in the marketplace preying uh, you know, greedily upon one another. And uh, as, we were, as I hope to show, the sages of the Axial Age uh, tried to find a cure uh, we, uh, f because as the world was changing, the older traditions no longer worked. Uh, for, and people had to find a new and different way of being religious. Now, first of all, uh, I, they often, uh, the Axial Age sages, seem to say things that sh would be shocking to some people today, uh, to some religious people today. Uh, the first one would be more likely to shock a Western audience, I think, than an audience largely composed of Muslims. Um, that religion is not about believing doctrines. It's not about accepting certain propositions of the creed. This has been a peculiar uh, preoccupation of Western Christianity in particular, especially since the Enlightenment. But the sages of the Axial Age were not, any of them, interested in dogma or belief or metaphysics, at least not in defining it. This doesn't mean they weren't interested in the reality that we call God or the sacred or Brahma or Nirvana or the Tao. 
uh, they were, this was the center of their lives. It was the, the goal to which they were aspiring. But they were insistent that this was transcendent. That meant it goes beyond the, the reach of concepts and words. Now, very often people, religious people, I'm sure no one here, but uh, the, the, often religious people say, yes, we know God is transcendent, but we know what he's like. Uh, that was not good enough for the Axial Age sages. I remember as a young girl, eight years old, I was given a, a catechism answer uh, to learn by heart on the question, what is God? And uh, what is God? God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections, I parroted. Um, I have to say that at eight years old, that definition didn't mean much to me. Um, and I'm bound to say that it still leaves me cold. I, but I've also come to say, because of my studies, that it is incorrect. Because it takes it for granted that it is possible simply to draw breath and define a word that literally means to set limits upon a reality that must go beyond any definition that is possible. Uh, once you think you've defined God, you've cut God down to a human system of thought and lost that sense of transcendence. So um, uh, the, they, the, the Axial Sages recommended silence. Oh, said Confucius to his disciples one day, I wish I did not have to speak. Oh, but master, said the disciples, what would we say to our students if you didn't speak to us, if you didn't teach us? And Confucius replied, heaven does not speak. And by heaven, he referred to the high God. But he said, look how effective heaven is. Because of heaven, the stars wheel on their constellations. The seasons succeed one another in due order. Uh, uh, the, the people live and die. And yet, heaven does no speaking. And what Confucius was implying, that if we desisted from a lot of theological chatter and argument, uh, we might become as effective as heaven ourselves. The Buddha had a monk who was continually pestering him about uh, who had created the world, and was the world created in time, and ha or had it always been there? Was there a god? And he wasn't getting on with his yoga and his ethical practice. And the Buddha told him he was like a, uh, a man who'd been shot with a poisoned arrow, but who refused to have any medical treatment until he found out the name of the person who shot him and what village he came from. <laughs> You'll die, the Buddha said, before you get this perfectly pointless information. We could, oh monks, he said, and here I paraphrase, of course, while away many happy hours discussing these perfectly fascinating topics. But what good will it do you? Even if we found out who created the world and how exactly how he did it and when, uh, cruelty, pain, despair, uh, uh, sorrow, illness, sickness, old age, death would still exist. Uh, I'm teaching you truths that will help you to live in peace with these realities and discover nirvana within yourselves, but you won't get that by theological chatter. The Greek Orthodox Christians uh, developed uh, a, a very important uh, principle that they said should govern every single theological statement. Uh, they said any statement about God should have two characteristics. One, it should be paradoxical, to remind you that God couldn't fit neatly into a human system of thought. And second, it should lead to silence. Um, instead, of, uh, instead of chattering away or reeling off a definition like the one I gave you in the, my Catholic catechism, uh, a th every theological statement should be like a great poem. Uh, and, you know, at the end of a great, when you've listened to the, a reading of a great poem or you're present at a symphony, sometimes before the applause breaks out, there's a beat of silence in the hall where you feel that there's, there's nothing to say. And that is what every theological statement should be. It should be a poet, poetic act, carefully made, designed to lead to silent awe and, and a realization that when we're speaking of God or the divine, we've gone beyond the reach of what words and thoughts can do. And I think you have this tradition very much in Islam, certainly in the Ismaili 
uh, tradition because the Ismailis were very strong on this, saying that you could not imagine that the idea of God you had in your head bore any relation to uh, the, the, the ineffable, indescribable reality itself. And I haven't got time uh, now to explain to you that uh, the, the Trinity, uh, and I'm not surprised that Muslims sometimes find this a puzzling doctrine, because Western Christians are often dismayed by it because it was formulated by Greeks. But the, the, the Trinity, Trinitarian theology, understood a la Grec, is really uh, designed to lead you to that sense of the unknowingness of God. And I, if anyone wants to ask me a question time, I'll be happy to expand that point. Now, the Quran calls that, the, the Quran did, obviously was puzzled by uh, Trinity as it was, as it was probably, uh, it was probably very confusing when it was described by met some contemporary Christians. Uh, but the Quran calls um, theological chatter or theological dogma or obligatory doctrines zanna, self-indulgent guesswork about matters that nobody can be sure of one way or the other, but which makes people quarrelsome and stupidly sectarian. Oh, people of the book, are you, are you mad? Abraham was neither a Jew nor, nor was he a Christian. Why, how can you, who can, can say that God sired a son? Again, these are ineffable matters. And once you start being doctrinaire about it, then you are, you're, you're losing the plot religiously, uh, religion is, is, is about uh, silence. Now, the, um, the Taoists in China uh, said that really the problem with dogma was that it made people uh, dogmatic, uh, that it made people sort of thump tables and say, I'm right, you're wrong, uh, this is right, this is wrong, I believe this, you believe that, you're wrong, and this is all an endorsement of ego. Uh, the, uh, the Taoists were saying, look, uh, there's a quarrel here in China. Some people say the Confucians are right. Some people say the followers of Mozi are right. Uh, but why can't they both be right? These are indescribable matters. And in China, they developed, at the end of the Axial Age, a, a, a syncretism whereby they realized the, 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 the uh, good points and strong points of all the schools uh, and seeing them all as valid, because nobody could have the last word on something that exceeds words. But ego is the great, um, the great enemy of the spiritual life, and this is what was they, they all discovered. Uh, and so and often when people are, is, are tub thumping their opinions, they are really saying, "I, I, I, I think that," and uh, and. There's a sort of puffed up sense, leave it, let it go, uh, they would say, and remember that you are in the presence of the ineffable and the indescribable. Mm -hmm. Now, yoga, I'm sure this is not, I, I was told uh, that because of various political uh, developments, yoga and Indian Hindu uh, spirituality is not exactly popular in Pakistan. Nevertheless, um, it has been, it was an important spiritual technology, the Axial Age, so bear with me a, a little while. Um, it's very popular in the West today. All kinds of people are rushing to have yoga classes in gyms and meditation halls, etc. But um, it would be uh, very, it would be a surprising thing um, to the, the, the way yoga is taught now. Uh, originally, in the Axial Age, the purpose of yoga was not, an, it was not to be an aerobic exercise. It was not designed to help you to lose weight, nor was it designed to help you to feel more peaceful about yourself and sort of more satisfied and all. It was designed to dis dismantle the ego to take the I out of our thinking by a series of exercises in concentration that would certainly be beyond me um, and, and, I, 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 and uh, would, would, was really possible for very skilled pe people and was a full-time job. No chance of just bopping in for a yoga class twice a week. Uh, this, was, this was a lifetime's work, a steady dismantling of ego. And once you started to look at reality, uh, the successful yogins found. Without that film of ego that constantly uh, gets in the way of our perception, you saw the world afresh. 
uh, without that the distorting filter. Because we all do it. We are biologically programmed to put number one first. So when we hear a piece of news, instinctively we say, how is that going to affect me? Or if we look at something, we say, do I like this? Am I attracted to that? Do I want this? Is this going to threaten my position? Now, if you take that ego out, then uh, you start seeing and experiencing the world differently. Then it's the ego principle that this, and by that, uh, they were really talking about selfishness. Uh, of course you, of course you have a self, uh, and the Buddha said, uh, you know, he developed a doctrine called anatta, no self. But uh, he didn't mean really that uh, there was no such thing as the self, as some postmodern uh, literary critics have suggested. He was saying, behave as though the self did not exist and you'll be happier. And I'm sure that he's right. I don't know uh, if any of you wake up at three in the morning and the thoughts that go through one's head in those dark moments are very much on the line of why did this happen to me? Uh, why don't I have what X has? Uh, at this kind of preoccupation with self and our self-success so that it's hard to rejoice at the success of others and uh, we like to gloat over the wrongdoings of others. Uh, all this uh, enhances ego, and it doesn't make us happy. And if you step outside that, you have um, a, a different perspective. Now, the first thing, as far as we know, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made his converts do in Mecca when he started to preach to them was to pray, prostrate themselves in prayer. Uh, s several times a day. And this was very difficult for the Arabs who didn't approve of kingship and found it extremely degrading to grovel on the ground like a slave. But the posture of the body uh, was designed to teach them at a level that was deeper than the rational what was involved in the act of Islam, the surrender of the ego. Uh, the surrender of that prancing uh, self, posturing self, that is continually, uh, you know, uh, post uh, posturing around, drawing attention to itself, look, bustling around self-importantly, to let that go uh, and to bow your head to the dust. Now, um, we all, human beings, we seek out ecstasy. Uh, the a Greek-derived word, ekstasis, it means stepping outside. Um, and we seek ex that sense when we feel deeply touched within sometimes and lifted momentarily beyond ourselves. We seek it in our lives. We feel we inhabit our humanity more fully than ever at such moments. And uh, the religious use ekstasis to bring them into the presence of the divine. Um, and Ecstasis, it means stepping outside the ego, stepping outside the self. And we are so programmed that if we can't consistently try to get beyond selfishness and greed and self-centeredness and s dreary self-preoccupation which imprisons our, us in a very limited view of the world, then we do achieve an enhancement of being. Ecstasis, and many people in the West are not finding ecstasy in religion anymore, so they're seeking it out in music and uh, dance and uh, sex and drugs and, other, and some misconceived uh, places. But ecstasy is something we seek out in our lives. The trick is to use it to come into the divine, not into just uh, a self-inflated cloud nine, which is a, simply an enhancement of ego. Um, now, I spent a great deal of my youth as a nun, and we indulged in certain pa uh, practices that were designed to get rid of ego. Um, uh, we had to sort of crawl around on the ground and kiss people's feet and beat our breasts and confess our faults in public, and, uh, and it was all, I can tell you, a complete waste of time. 
Uh, we spend so much time examining our consciences and you know, mulling over our faults and failings that we were actually in, imprisoned in the ego that we were supposed to transcend. Um, so I'm not talking about that kind of ego bashing. The sages of the Axial Age found that the best way of getting rid of ego was by the practice of compassion. And this was the bedrock of their spirituality, as it is the bedrock of the principle of Islam. You, you begin every reading of the Quran uh, by invoking uh, the compassion and the mercy of Allah, uh, and are told to imitate his compassion and benevolence in, uh, that we see in the signs of nature in our dealings with other people. Compassion, to feel with the other, kompathein in a Greek, to feel with the other. Compassion demands that consistently you dethrone yourself from the center of your world and put another there. And you learn to see the other as sacred. Um, now, the many of these traditions uh, devoted the, uh, the, expressed this by the, what, what's been become known as the golden rule. Don't do to others what you would not like them to do to you. And uh, this sounds um, easy, but it's not easy. Uh, Confucius, as far as we know, was the first person uh, to formulate the golden rule. He was asked by his disciples, Master, what is the single thread that runs through all your teachings? What's the single thread that pulls everything together? And Confucius said, Shu, likening to the self. Look into your own heart. Discover what it is that gives you pain. And then refuse under any circumstances whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. Do not do to others as you would not have done unto you. And that, Confucius said, was religion. And this was one of the central messages of the Axial Age. If you behaved with absolute compassion to others, feeling with the other day by day, hour by hour, uh, then you achieve constant ecstasy. So you're constantly stepping outside the self and, they say, coming into the presence of what the, the, the Confucians call, and the Chinese called the Tao the ultimate reality. Um, and this, this was a common thread. Con Buddha said that it was the practice of compassion that brought you into the present, into nirvana, that sacred peace uh, that enables you to live without pain. Um, that, so, uh, the great, my favorite golden rule story, however, is that of cons associated with Rabbi Hillel the older contemporary of Jesus, who was approached one day by a pagan who promised to convert to Judaism on condition that Hillel could recite the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg. And Hillel stood on one leg and said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. Uh, that is the Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and study it. And that's a remarkable statement because there is no mention of God or the creation of the world in six days, no mention of 613 commandments, no mention of Mount Sinai, the exodus from Egypt, or the promised land, all things that we think are essential to Judaism, but it was all there in the golden rule. Endlessly putting yourself out for the other, you will come into the presence of God. The whole of the Torah was designed, Hillel claimed, to introduce that spirit of loving kindness, of compassion to others. And can, this was to be not just a, a one-off thing that you, were, you did once a week or something. You were supposed to do it, as Confucius said, all day and every day. Master, which of your teachings can we put into practice all day and every day? Do not do to others as you would not have done to you, said Confucius. And one of his disciples said, Oh, Master, I never do to other people what I wouldn't like done to myself. And Confucius laughed and he said, no, no, you're not there yet. Uh, if we did this day by day, hour by hour, if every time we felt tempted to say something unpleasant about an annoying colleague um, or an ex-wife, 
or um, a country with whom we're at war, and then said, how would we like this said about us, and desisted, in that moment, we would have gone beyond the self and have achieved an ecstasy and come into the presence of the divine. Jesus certainly, certainly made that point. Um, and the essence of the essence of um, uh, the, of, of the Quran is not a doctrine, but an imper a command to to sit constantly behave to others as we would like to be be behaved to ourselves. At the last day, um, we will be asked, "How did you treat your fellow people? Did you hoard your wealth selfishly, or did you distribute it fairly? Did you share with others?" And there is a lovely story in the Torah uh, about Abraham, father of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. One day, Abraham was sitting outside his tent at Mamre near Hebron, now unfortunately um, a site of extreme violence and tension and hatred. But Abraham saw three strangers walk on the horizon. Now, strangers uh, in the ancient world, as in our own day, were very threatening and frightening people. Um, because uh, they, uh, they weren't bound by the laws of vendetta. And indeed, very few of us today would bring three total strangers off the street into our own house. But that's what Abraham did. He ran out in the hottest part of the day and prostrated himself on the ground before these strangers as though they were kings or gods and brought them back to his encampment and gave them not just a glass of water and a sandwich, but an elaborate meal, pouring out on these three total strangers all the refreshment that he could for their journey. And in the ensuing conversation, it transpired quite naturally, without any great fanfare, that one of those strangers is Abraham's God. The act of compassion has led to a divine encounter. It has led, brought Abraham into the presence of the divine. And that point about the stranger is very important because the Axial Age sages all insisted, all insisted, that uh, you could not confine your compassion to your own group. You had to, it had to be, you had to practice what one of what Mozi, a Chinese sage, called Jan Ai, concern for everybody. Because if you confine your uh, compassion just to your own congenial little friends. This is just group egotism. You've got somehow to go beyond, to take, to take that, and this is the spirit that we need today in our increasingly polarized world where we're getting split up into tribes and nations and, and, uh, and at war with one another. Um, now, the, um, you, in Leviticus, for example, in the, in the Jewish Torah, you're told to love the stranger. And the word love uh, did not mean that we were supposed to be filled with warm, tender affection for the stranger. The word, it, this was a legal text, and this was a legal term used in international treaties, which said that you must uh, support them, give be loyal to them, give them practical support and help, and look out for their interests. This is something we can all do. If a stranger lives with you in your land, says the Torah, do not molest him. You must treat him as one of your own people and love him as yourself, for you were strangers in Egypt. Again, empathy, compassion to feel with the other, look into your own heart, discover what it was that gave you pain in the past when you were strangers and marginalized, and therefore refuse to inflict this on anybody else, not even the stranger. Jesus is supposed to have told his followers to love your enemies. Um, and uh, by that, he didn't mean that we were again to be filled with soggy affection for enemies, but to look out for them and to give your benevolence where there's no hope of any return, where there's no hope of an egotistic, self-interested return. Now, I haven't spoken much about the Greeks because the Greeks didn't really have a religious axial age. They were Westerners. They weren't so good at religion. They were better at science and philosophy, more interested in. And ultimately, they didn't have a religious axial age, but they made one very important contribution in their tragic drama, which was a religious festival. Every year on the festival of Dionysus, 
all Athenians had to congregate in the specially built theatre on the Acropolis to watch uh, tragic plays uh, that uh, usually considered some of the problems that Athens was facing at that, in that year, but set back in a mythical guise. Uh, so that, and it was a communal meditation. Uh, it was not a choice to go. Everybody was obliged to go. All citizens were obliged to attend the plays. Uh, it wasn't a question of, have you caught the latest Aeschylus yet? You had to go and watch it. Even, they even let prisoners out of prison, out of jail, in order to participate in this communal meditation. And during the course of these dramas, the leader of the chorus would uh, ask um, the audience to weep. And to weep for men uh, or women uh, who, in real life, we wouldn't give uh, room to, to Oedipus, a man who, albeit unwittingly, had killed his father and married his mother, uh, to Heracles, who was driven mad by the goddess Hera and killed his wife and children. And they, he, they were told, weep, feel with this man. And the Greeks did weep. Uh, they weren't like a lot of Western men today who uh, were in front, confronted with something sad, just gulp hard and wipe an embarrassed tear from the corner of their eyes. They wept aloud because they believed that weeping together created a bond between human beings. Um, and the first of these plays come, to come down to us is The Persians by Aeschylus. It was written five years after the Battle of Salamis, uh, when the Greeks had actually won that battle, naval battle, eventually. But before they won, the Persians had rampaged through Athens, absolutely vandalized and looted the city, and knocked to the ground and destroyed all the beautiful new temples that had been built on the Acropolis. And now, five years after the Battle of Salamis, Aeschylus asks the Greek Athenian audience to weep for the Persians. This, it, he tells the story from the Persians' point of view. Um, and he tells them that, um, to, uh, that, that the Persians are treated with great respect. There's no triumphalism, no jeering. Xerxes, the uh, defeated leader, is led it with great respect and honor into his house. Um, and uh, the Persians are said to be the sister race of the, of, of the Athenians, guilty, like the Athenians themselves, of hubris, of overweening pride in going beyond what they should. Now, I think we have to ask ourselves, I often ask a Western audience, five years after September the 11th, would we be ready to put on such a play on, in Broadway or in the West End in London that considered uh, that atrocity from the point of view of the other side? And that is what uh, the Axial Sages said you must do. There's a lovely story in Homer, and Homer wasn't an Axial Age sage at all, but this, this incident from the Iliad is, is in the essence of Axial Age spirituality. The Iliad, as you know, uh, describes the 10-year uh, war between uh, uh, Troy and Greece. And it describes just one tiny incident in it, concerned with Achilles, the leading warrior in the Greek camp, who withdraws from the fight in a matter of pure egotistic pride. And as a result of his withdrawal, his best friend, Patroclus, is slain uh, by the great Trojan prince, Hector. And so Achilles challenges Hector to a duel. He's driven mad by grief. He was, before this, he was a loving, tender-hearted man, but he's become inhuman, and he kills Hector, and he mutilates the body, and he be he's lost his humanity. The gods look on and say, this man has lost his humanity. He drags Hector's body round and round the stadium, and then refuses to give it to the family for burial. Uh, and then, uh, one night, into the Greek camp, incognito, comes Priam, king of Troy, the old king of Troy. He, he comes to the tent of Achilles. Achilles has killed nearly all his sons, and he comes humbly to him to ask for the body of Hector. And everybody's astonished and tense. And Achilles looks at the old man, who suddenly reminds him of his own father, and he starts to weep. And 
Priam also starts to weep. And the sound of their weeping fills the tent and all the encampment around. And then when the silence ensues, the two men look at each other and each sees the other as divine. That when you've made the effort to put yourself into the place of the enemy, uh, you are beginning uh, the, to, uh, to, to knock down that egotism and see your, your enemy, just like any other human being, as sacred, and you're in the presence of God. Yeah. Now, um, the, Muhammad, I would just, uh, at the, when, at the, when he conquered Mecca, this is one of, my, one of the most inspiring moments to me in the life of the prophet, uh, when he invites, stands by the Kaaba and invites the Quraysh, his tribe, to enter Islam and says to them, O Quraysh, God is calling you from the chauvinism of Jahiliya with its pride in ancestors, all this puffed up pride in your own tradition. But remember, all men come from Adam and Adam came from dust. And then he quotes from the Quran where God says to humanity, O oh people, we have created you from a male and a female and have formed you into tribes and nations so that you may know one another. Uh, not so that you may uh, kill or uh, dominate or co colonize or exploit or conquer but so that you may know one another, because the experience of living in your own tribe means that you're endlessly uh, rubbing up against people who you don't get on with. Even in your own family, there are people sometimes you don't get on with. And this is a dress rehearsal for uh, experiencing the other uh, that is even more far away, always constantly in the Quran, and I think in the life of the Prophet, and indeed in Islam with its pluralistic outreach, you have a sense of, 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 of reconciliation, bringing, uh, bringing an end to enmity uh, and reaching out to the other. Now, one thing that absolutely astonished me in my researches was that in every single case, uh, the catalyst for major religious change during the Axial Age was a, a, a retreat from violence. The sages looked around the horror that was imploding in their own societies and were, and, and were so horrified that they started uh, to find other ways. Compassion was the, was the uh, ideology that would counter the, the, the destructive power of violence, but, they, but in every single case, they, they withdrew from violence. The Greeks didn't do this. The Greeks actually spread violence around. And, uh, and, and, and so everybody in Athens became a fighting man. And they didn't have a religious axial age. Nonviolence became absolutely key. Now, in the Bible, you have, because it's a very, very long and complex work, it's different from the Quran, which, is, uh, which it comes, came down to the prophet in 23 years. They were talking about a 1,000 years of, uh, of, of revelation. Um, and here you have, I think, very, a very honest tussle in the Bible. Uh, you have the, uh, the axial age spirit of reconciliation, like the, uh, uh, one, the, the spirit, the ones I've quotations about loving the stranger. But you also have uh, people who don't want to be um, <laughs> nonviolent at all. And so you have here a continual tussle, and I think both Jews and Christians need to study their scriptures and have a look at, uh, at how these, uh, the, the, these uh, contrasting spiritualities uh, uh, deal with one another. But um, in yoga, for example, uh, nonviolence was the basis of the yogic quest. Before you were allowed to start your yoga uh, discipline, you had to spend some time with a guru who introduced you to a five-point plan of ethical, an ethical program. And top of the list was ahimsa, Nonviolence, uh, and that didn't. And it, you know, it said you shan't kill anybody. Now, that didn't just mean that you couldn't go on a raid anymore or rustle your neighbor's cattle, which the Aryan tribes had done before. That's how they made their living. Uh, but it, they went further than this. 
They said they, that you must not even show violence in impatient speech, uh, an irritable gesture, uh, raising your eyebrows to the, uh, to this, to the heavens in disgust. Uh, you had to express in every move serenity and peace and friendliness to all. And until and unless your guru was satisfied that this had become second nature to you, you weren't even allowed to sit in the yogic position. Um, and the texts tell us that when they had mastered this, uh, the, this, the apprentice, the yogic apprentice, would experience great joy. Because I think we're probably programmed for violence. I mean, not, uh, when we came out of the caves, there were bigger predators than ourselves. We have to look after our family. And even today, I'm, uh, even perhaps in the Aga Khan University, the colleagues are sort of uh, loggerheads with each other and fighting for their own corners. And even, even if we're not coming to blows, we are uh, very much looking after ourselves uh, it's very rare to apologize for anything without pointing out clearly that the other person is also at fault. Uh, we're always guarding our corner. Now, if we let that go, we probably would enter an alternative state of consciousness. It would be the beginning of, of transformation for us. Um, Jesus uh, was a, a man of nonviolence. He said uh, to his disciples in, in one of the Gospels, uh, to turn the other cheek when attacked, to love your enemies, not to retaliate. Um, even though there are other parts of the New Testament, I agree, where, which don't live up to that ahimsa. But Muhammad too, I mean, I want to spend a little time on this, who's often portrayed in the West as a, a man of war. Uh, his wars were reluctant. He was being attacked by Mecca. And in war, as we know, dreadful things happen on all sides. We've seen that. Uh, recently. But when Muhammad was able to turn, felt that the time was right, he initiated a non-violent campaign. Uh, he announced, of course, uh, that he was going to make the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. And on the Hajj, you couldn't carry an, uh, any weapons to defend yourself. And um, it, he was going unarmed into the lion's den. And there, um, his, uh, Omar said, no, no, you can't do this. We, we, what are you talking about? Don't be ridiculous. And Muhammad said, no, this is what we're going to do. And a thousand Muslims took this risk. They were, the Meccans sent the cavalry out to kill them all. Muhammad managed to get round into the sanctuary of Mecca where all violence was forbidden. And there he sat down and waited for the Quraysh to negotiate with him. And when they came to negotiate, Muhammad accepted terms which disgusted his followers because he, th he seemed to have given away too much. But when he was on his way home, uh, he had a revelation which said that this apparent defeat had been a great victory, a manifest victory. And that it was this spirit of peace, the Sakina, which had descended upon the Muslims, whereas the, the Meccans had been filled with the old violence of Jahiliya. Uh, and it was this that put them in the, this spirit of peace that put them in the same spirit uh, as the people of the Torah, the people of the gospel. And the, the Muslim historians say that indeed the peace at Hudaybiyah was the beginning of the end of the war. It was the turning point, the watershed. After that, where there was a chance for people, there was a chance where there hadn't been before for people to sit down and consider. Uh, Islam uh, in, a, in, a, in a rational way, and more people started to convert to Islam. So what have we learned? What, uh, what is religion? It, religion is not doctrine. Religion is not obligatory belief. Religion is not violent. I mean, it is not compatible with religion to be violent. Uh, and, um, but it is about uh, compassion, it is about the golden rule, and it is about the stranger, about reaching out beyond your own community. So what went wrong? Um, well, religion is very hard to do, and uh, often, I fear, religious people prefer to be right rather than compassionate. Um, you know, it, I, not everybody wants to be compassionate. 
And not everybody wants to be utterly transformed by religion. They often want religion to sort of give them a, a bit of extra pizzazz so that they're even more themselves, or to give them a little uplift once a week so they can return to their normal lives. But religion as it should be, uh, if you want to enter the presence of the divine, means to divest yourself of self uh, and reach out with compassion. Religion is altruism. And religion does not know the boundaries of tribe and nation, um, as, as, as the Quran makes so clear. And what um, we need now in this world is this spirit. We're seeing religion used for all kinds of nefarious, selfish ends. And uh, what we need now is a, a compassionate offensive made by every single religious person, whatever his or her creed. Uh, we need to apply now the golden rule globally to treat, realize that others, even who are far away and distant from us, are as important as ourselves. Not to treat others as we would not wish to be treated ourselves. The West has a huge lesson to learn here. Uh, but we all have to learn it together because uh, unless uh, we uh, are going to turn, to, to, to turn away from this uh, sort of quick antagonism and from the defensiveness that religious people are in now, especially Muslims, you're in a very difficult position. You're constantly having to defend Islam, and that puts you on this, on, you know, on, in, in, in a slightly uh, uneasy, antagonistic position. It's very hard. Uh, but we need to see, the world needs to see uh, the spirit of Islam, the, the spirit of Hudaybiyah, the spirit of, of compassion, of salat, of, of zakat, of sharing with others, uh, of surrendering the ego. And Christians need to do it too, because uh, and so, do, so do the Jewish people. Um, we we need do to treat others as we would, not, we, we would wish to be treated ourselves. Uh, and very often, some, what happens sometimes is that compassion is such a difficult discipline and so demanding, demanding constant effort, day by day, hour by hour, that we erect secondary goals um, in the Christian world, wh wh which is my, where I come from originally. Uh, it's, you know, it's what... what kind of contraception a woman is allowed to use is discussed endlessly. And, the in, and uh, is such and such a statement, uh, does it cohere with the Council of Chalcedon or something? Now this is, or this is a distraction because what the world needs now is compassion. The dedicated spirit of compassion uh, that is at the heart of all these traditions. So we don't need a new prophet or a new sage. Because in all our traditions, we need simply to go back to the core and discover that lost heart of empathy, uh, which was the inspiration of every single one of our, of our wonderful traditions. Thank you very much. We now have time for some questions and answers. Uh, we have this uh, lecture being uh, telecast live to five other uh, lecture halls. So there may be questions coming in from these other venues as well. I will ask the conference secretary staff to collect on, a, on the pieces of paper the questions being asked at the other venues. Here, if you have a question, I would ask you to raise your hand. And, and someone will bring a cordless mic to you. Can I see the cordless mics? There's one here and one there. Go. Okay. Now, uh, please uh, identify yourself before you ask the question. Professor Ahmed, there's a mic behind you. Can I ask? Without Wait. No, no. You, have, you need to use the mic because okay. there are people sitting in other venues as well. Sorry, I'm strong. Your lecture was very lucid, and you talked of on. <coughs> the thesis of nonviolence and compassion. And the antithesis in what Christ said, of course, the compassion is one side, but he also talked about hell and hellfire and violence. Mm -hmm. So how these two things are compatible? They are the thesis and antithesis. Am 
my second question is, if you see a loop between creator and creation, so there is a, on one side there is an involution, on the other side there is an evolution. Mm -hmm. So how this loop would function, and, and if there is no violence, then mm -hmm. I see the what violence is redundant. Right, for two good questions. Um, Jesus, yes indeed, as I said, uh, both the New Testaments have a disturbing mingling of violence uh, with the command to love, just as the Jewish scriptures do. Um, I have to say we don't know much about what Jesus actually said. Um, the, 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 these were written down, these traditions were written, it's not like the Quran. The traditions were written down a long time afterwards. The New Testament's more like the Hadith, uh, where you have some Hadith that are... Um, I, think, geez, I think one of the problems about Christianity as a religion is, has been that it was, from the beginning, an apocalyptic faith. It was looking forward to an imminent end of history. Right here, uh, St. Paul thought it would come in his own lifetime. And that means that there, there is, I quite agree with you, there is this strong uh, compulsion to, uh, to, to say, you know, those of you who don't come are going to be cast out into hellfire. Actually, the full-blown doctrine of hell was a later dastardly <laughs> creation. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 there's, this is just, um, we, we're not quite sure what Jesus meant by hell or indeed by the kingdom of heaven, whether this was a celestial thing or whether it was going to be an earthly kingdom uh, uh, on earth. But certainly the ap apocalypse is difficult. And apocalypse is what is fueling uh, the uh, Christianity of the Christian right in the United States, who are expecting, again, an imminent end of days. And that leads them to all kinds of very, un uh, very violent kinds of theologies. And there has always been that tension uh, in Christianity. Um, just as there's a tension, you know, people are always quoting those bits about in from the Quran about holy war and, and jihad, you know, uh, jihad, etc. Longs, and there are also those ones which are which the uh, where he, where the Quran speaks definitely about the importance of reconciliation, forgiveness, and peace. So I think, uh, and as for yes, I mean, uh, the, the 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 people of India, especially the Jains and the Buddhists went into non-violence in a, a major way. Muhammad uh, was more realistic. He knew that there would sometimes, it would sometimes perhaps be essential to fight. Um, and indeed, uh, the Bhagavad Gita comes to the same conclusion. At the end of the Axial Age, the Bhagavad Gita will, will says, yes, that sometimes you have to fight. As you pointed out, nature red in tooth and claw. We, but it's precisely because violence is so bound up in our survival for existence that if we can, as far as we are able, step outside it, then we achieve a different phase of consciousness. Uh, I think that that I think that is what they, they were under. They, they didn't know about evolution or Darwin or anything, but clearly they understood that um, that 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 some that that, that that violence was deeply embedded in our psyche, and that if we could get beyond it, then we would experience a different kind of humanity. They were very ambitious. Uh, some of us are, are less ambitious, um, and, um, and and and. Our scriptures are, um, are, are filled with co these kind of contradictions as we struggle for an ideal that is often beyond us. Uh, we re we're reaching out for something, and some people just flop by the wayside, and, and, and then you have, a, uh, just as you have in the Jewish scriptures, a resurgence of, but I do think apocalypse, uh, imminent apocalypse, imminent end of days, uh, does lead into this uh, division of the world into good, two camps, one good, one evil. We're hearing a lot of that talk today. Um, and, uh, and an enemy who is an absolute enemy and, um, and, and of a coming final conflagration when the enemy will be utterly destroyed. This uh, is, I think, what the Buddha would call unskillful religion. It won't help you.
Trinity, all right. Now, the, in the New Testament, uh, the, uh, the, the, the writers were Jewish, and they used Jewish ideas. They used Jewish ideas, it's called the, the Holy Spirit, which was God present as we experience God within us. Uh, or the presence of God, the word of God, which was not like my words are mine, but they're not the whole of me. I am speaking my words and they are I, uniquely mine, but they never express the whole of me. There's always something uh, th th that's left unsaid. <coughs> There's always something that's left unsaid. Um, and so, but then the uh, Bible went into the Christian Gentile world and by the third or fourth century, people no longer understood these Jewish concepts and they were very confused. Who was the Holy Spirit? And if Jesus was divine in some way, was he, were there two gods or were there three? Um, now, um, the Cappadocian fathers, they were, they were three wonderful bishops who lived in what's now Turkey, took time out from their diocese in the late fourth century. They were men of great prayer this was not just a clever dick uh, superficial s uh, syndrome. It was uh, something to, to pray about. Uh, that, uh, that God, as God is in God's self, the essence of God, what they called in Greek God's usia, <coughs> this is something unknown to us and absolutely transcendent. We never experience God's usia. Uh, God is beyond us. Um, and w when, when we talk about God, we're not talking about God's usia. But God in God's mercy has reached out kindly towards us to make, to adapt himself to, uh, in, into concepts and ways that we can understand. And Christians have experienced God in the world uh, as a father. Um, as a sense of where we, as, as the father of us, as where we come from, the source of our being, a benevolent spirit watching over us. As, as word, Jesus is the word of God. Uh, as I said, our words are us, but not the whole of us. Uh, our word, my words are mine and mine only, but there's my own usia still mysterious, both to you and even to me from time to time. I'm of, often surprising myself. Usia, so the word of God, and the spirit is God within us, the God we encounter in our hearts. These are not three gods, but they are God as God trying to communicate with us. Uh, they called uh, God, God's usia was on one side. What, what they also said was God had hypostases. Uh, and we have, that is the outward manifestations of our personality, where we try to express the deep mystery of our inner nature. And we do it in all kinds of ways, by our facial expressions, uh, by our, um, the clothes we choose, uh, by uh, the words we choose, uh, by our actions in the world, we try to express what we, what the mystery of ourselves and m to make ourselves known to other people. And these uh, Father, Son, and Spirit are God's hypostases. They're not God himself, but they're the ways in which God has spoken to, tried to communicate with us. And one of the Cappadocian fathers said, look, don't think Father, Son, and Spirit are three ontological realities, as it's sometimes depicted in Christian art with a father of the beard and a Jesus and a, a dove flapping around. These are, this is infantile. These terms, father, son, and spirit, are simply, and here I quote, terms that we use to describe the way in which the invisible and indescribable God makes himself known to us. Now, when I used to teach at a, a Jewish college, uh, in a rabbinic college in London, and I always enjoyed teaching the Trinity because I'd be doing, I had a blackboard there and I could do things on the blackboard. And I always enjoyed the moment when I turned around and saw the class with their mouths open because they were saying, oh, but this is exactly like our Kabbalah. Uh, we ha you have three hypostases, we have 10. But God's usia, we call God Ein Sof, God without end, that we never know. 
Um, and what the Cappadocians were trying to do was to say, uh, to remind Christians that we could never think about God as a simple personality. Uh, because a lot of problems come when we think of God as simply a being like ourselves, writ large, with likes and dislikes similar to our own. This can be an idolatry, something you, we create in our own image and likeness. Uh, and, um, and, and some great atrocities are committed. The Crusaders went into battle crying, God wills it when they killed Jews and Muslims. Obviously, God willed no such thing. They were projecting their own hatred onto a being that they created in their own image. Uh, and so these trinity, like Kabbalah, was a way, and you have your own uh, ways. Uh, the Ismailis certainly uh, developed all kinds of spiritual ways of thinking about this. But you don't, it's not a rational thing. It's something that you pray. Unless you're praying it, uh, you don't really understand it. It's a, it's a method of meditation. To, and and, and uh, one of the Cappadocian fathers said uh, put, it was meant to be highly emotional and to lead to silence, as I said earlier. It was meant to be said beautifully. One of them said, when I think of the three, my thoughts go to the one, to the usia. And when I think of the one, because I, the one is beyond me, then I immediately think of the three that makes the one known. And my eyes fill with tears and I lose all sense of where I am. So that it's a sense that when you contemplate in this way, to remind you that what you experience of God is not God itself, but you are Allahu Akbar, God is always greater. Uh, that's how, what Trinity is trying to say. It's the kingpin of uh, Greek Orthodox spirituality. It's never translated well into the West. The West uh, the West at this time was not was, was still quite a backward region uh, in theological terms, and it didn't understand words like usia and hypostasis, uh, and thought that there were three human three personalities involved, and this this was not what they meant at all. I hope that's clear, uh, but um, it, because it, these things are not e they, we are talking about the ineffable here, uh, but but remember that 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 is an attempt to express the indescribability and transcendence of, of God. Thank you. There is a uh, question from the Father of Auditorium. If all the religions of the world are delivering the same message of compassion and golden rule and killing the ego and self, then why every religious person has such an ego for his or her own Well, <laughs> well as, as I said, I, as I said, that people don't want to be compassionate. They don't want to keep the golden rule. They want to sing a few hymns or, or something and, and feel good about themselves because uh, the, the religious quest is difficult. And not everybody is prepared to be transformed. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it's not only the, uh, the, 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 the people, uh, rank and file, and even some of our religious leaders, uh, God help us, are filled with ego. Um, some are, are politicians, and, and, and politicians are not known for their lack of ego. Um, and it is, a, it is a constant struggle. Uh, but, and also, uh, because it's such a struggle, there we re because it's so hard to keep the golden rule, we, as I said, we erect all these other goals um, and dilute the message uh, to make it more comfortable for ourselves and so that we're not so deeply challenged. Uh, this is our failure, not the failure of the religions. between that and the concept of Trinity that you explained, because I think 
um, the change of from I to you to we, that is just a way of saying that God is uh, something that you cannot comprehend and it's a being, it's not something like you and me. So similarly, the Trinity, like you said, it's something similar to that. So is there a comparison that can be drawn there? I think, certainly, I think the Quran is constantly reminding people that we are not, we, that, that God is transcendent, that God is, is other. At the same time as we experience God in the great ayat, the great signs of his, and in the Quran. But uh, as you say, the constant shifting uh, between I and God, or your Lord, or we, uh, uh, is con so you're constantly in a different, as you listen to the Quran, in a different relationship with the divine. And similarly, the 99 names of God um, is a, a reminder, because some of these uh, names clash. God is all forgiving, and God is one who takes uh, who, reprisal. Um, and because of these, um, of these clashes, again, it's meant to remind you that God goes beyond our neat little concepts of what we think God might be. Um, and throughout Muslim history, too, just as throughout Jewish and Christian history, uh, the most adventurous and, mo and still most central theologians, too, were constantly reminding people not to think about God in a simplistic way. I think the Quran, uh, in the Qur the Quran is easier for, to, to, for that, in, in that reason, because God is less of a personality in the way that you've mentioned. In the early books of the Bible, uh, however, which is, a ve which is very, very old, some of it, it's a very primitive theology. You've got God behaving like a, a, a very unpleasant human being sometimes. Uh, and, uh, a God, you know, people, and a lot of people, have, and certainly in my country, who've read these early uh, stories, uh, uh, in, as they're told in the Bible, and some of these stories are told very differently in the Quran, uh, a retreat from such a God, because God is too personalized um, and too much like ourselves. Um, so, um, and, and, and sometimes we learn about God for the first time when we're little children, at the same time as we learn about Santa Claus. I'm sure you've heard of Santa Claus here. Um, and um, uh, you know, but, but we outgrow the concept of Santa Claus, but some people's idea of God remains in an infantile state, yeah. um, and they don't have the chance to expand it. Here, different at the Aga Khan University, I'm sure. But that is right, the Quran is constantly pushing you, uh, to, to sh to, and, 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 the, and his 99 names, and the, uh, is to say that God is greater than what we can speak or say, and constantly in Muslim spirituality, Sufi spirituality, Ismaili spirituality, Shia spirituality, that is the point that is being made by, the great, by all the great spiritual leaders and sages. back to the past and um, as, as a corollary to that, how far do we have to go before we get to the enlightened golden age again? Oh dear. Um, <laughs> I don't like these kind of correlations, you know, why can't the Muslims catch up with the West, for example? When, for example, are the West going to have a reformation? This is constantly said uh, in, 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 in the West, and I get really annoyed because it shows a misunderstanding of Islam, which has had constant reform movements, constant reform movements, and the Reformation in many ways was a complete disaster in Europe. It was uh, filled with violence, a lot of people were killed, uh, ca Catholics killed Protestants, Protestants killed Catholics, it inspired hideous wars of religion and split religion, uh, Europe into warring camps, and the Reformation was also part of our modernization process. Uh, it was part, because we were beginning to modernize in the 16th century, we could no longer be um, a, a sort of Christian in the way we had been in the Middle Ages. So things had to change. And a modernization is a violent, difficult time, like any period of social change. So, um, and I'm not sure we've ever reached a golden age of enlightenment, to be, to be frank. Uh, we thought we had in Europe in the 18th century and in the West, but then look what happened 
uh, in the 20th century. Uh, many people have said that the ideals of the Enlightenment died in Auschwitz, uh, where it, it was found that a great university could exist in the same neighborhood as a concentration camp, and that education and rationality didn't solve all our problems. And so we're all struggling now. And uh, Muslims uh, have, ha uh, have had, many of you, most of you, certainly here, have had the difficulty of, of colonialism, of coming to modernity uh, and getting enlightened ideas uh, from the West in a spirit of subjugation. Um, and that has, the modern spirit has two essential elements. Uh, one is independence, a uh, modernization preceded by declarations of independence on all fronts, intellectual, people demanded freedom to think and, and invent as they chose, uh, in, uh, political, uh, social, economic, uh, religious, Luther declared independence of the Catholic Church. And the second one was innovation, we were constantly doing something new. Now, unless you have these two spirits, you don't really have a modern country, however many skyscrapers and masts and uh, computers you have, uh, because uh, ad it's very difficult. With the, for the Muslim world, modernization did not come with independence, but with dependence, with colonial subjugation. And it wasn't innovation, because it was imitation. So things have got skewed, and things have been difficult. And it's difficult for us in Europe, too because we are now coming to terms with the iniquities of our colonial past. Uh, we, there's, there's, uh, you know, we are aware that our great ideas, uh, you know, when we colonized these countries, and did not come to fruition. We've created awful mess. Um, and, in even, and in the United States, even so, uh, you know, it's not all like the administration. There, are, there is a lot of self-questioning about what's been going on recently. So we're all in a difficult impasse, and, and, and it's, it's really very difficult to see how we are going to, because it's always difficult to forgive people you've harmed in some way. So there's, there's the, we're all fighting now an unknown future. We're in the same world, um, and I, when we're going to find, I hope, similar solutions, but we're coming to it from very different positions. Um, and so I, I don't subscribe to the idea that uh, the Muslim world has got to progress and go through all the stages that we have, and finally we'll arrive at a golden age. We've never achieved a golden age. Uh, but at the moment, our, um, our, our problems are, are such that we need of all of us to make a concerted spiritual effort because we are now one world. Uh, and what happens in one part of the world now has repercussions immediately, economically and politically, uh, in another. Uh, we, we, we can't any longer sort of cut ourselves off. And I think we've got to make a more concerted effort instead of saying, this is how you are, this is how you develop, this is how we developed, and you can try and catch us up, etc. We've got now to look at our common predicament, our shared predicament, and share our solutions and, uh, coming from our different perspectives. This is a comment and a question from uh, Mr. Nadeem Abogad. Karen, your humility aside, you are the first person in human history who has intelligently and compassionately analyzed human struggle, sometimes wonderful and sometimes horrific, to find sense and purpose to their existence. No one has intellectually shown where you are standing today, objective and independent. Question. Your most useful book that I, uh, in my opinion, is Battle for God. I think this is an amazing analysis, but I think you are the only person in the world who can take this thesis further to the future on the basis of, one, what should happen in the future, and two, what might happen in the future. We all love you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, but what a question. Um, now, what will happen in the future? What might happen in the future? What can we do? I mean, this is what we ask. If I knew the answer to this, maybe I would be killed, or maybe I would become the president of, uh, of the prime minister of the UK. Um, I don't doubt, doubt it. Uh, I think uh, 
what may happen is catastrophic. I think we are because we've, we have we are weak people, and our our violence, which the gentleman up there mentioned being endemic to our nature and our evolution, has always depended upon our creating technology that compensates for our inferior size. And as soon as we learn to bows and arrows and spears to extend our reach, now unfortunately we've created a technology uh, that has outrun our uh, ability almost to control it. And increasingly, small groups are going to have the powers of destruction that were previously uh, the preserve only of the nation state. And this is a very bleak scenario. Um, a very bleak scenario indeed. And, 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 and I, you don't need me to tell you uh, what, what, might ha what the catastrophic effect this might have for our children. And let alone there's the problem too of the environment. Uh, what we're doing to the planet, which uh, damaging it uh, every year, uh, to leading to, to an unimaginable catastrophe. And I've spoken to m my own generation, and they say, oh, don't worry, Karen, we'll all be dead by then. Uh, but this is not a risible act attitude of a religious steward holding the world in trust for the next generation. Think of, we have to think of our children, our grandchildren. So the future looks bleak, but one can never lose hope one must not lose hope because hope lead, hopelessness leads to the kind of despair uh, that we see in the atrocities. When people feel they've got nothing to lose, then you have suicide bombing and suicide attacks and the kind of horror that we've seen. Um, so, what, so we must not lose hope and religion is about trying to find hope because we are beings that fall very easily into despair. Uh, we are so programmed that unlike other, other animals, like cats and dogs, we agonize about our condition, our mortality, about the state of the world, and it's usually bad, and we, all, we fall into despair. Now, what I think, uh, what's characterized the people I was talking about uh, in the Axial Age, Buddha, uh, Muhammad, let's say, later, Jesus, uh, the Hebrew prophets, the rabbis, the, uh, the sages of the Upanishads, uh, the Confucians, they worked at religion. They really worked at it. They worked as hard at finding a cure for the spiritual welfare of humanity as we today are working to find a cure for cancer. Uh, we need, and often we see religion as something we inherit and we pass on intact. Not at all, they didn't. They said, we'll change things. We've got to make these, the traditions we've inherited, speak to now, to our perilous situation now. Muhammad did this. In, you, you know, of course, that when he received his revelations, he would be sweating with the effort, be pale, almost fainting, with the effort of trying to find a solution for his people. And this is what we must do today. We must try and work with our traditions, which tell us what to do. They tell us to be compassionate. They tell us to be less egotistical, to be not violent. And we need to get that voice out there to reclaim religion from the extremists and from the hardliners who, who, who want to hold righteousness to themselves. Uh, but we need to work hard, be inventive and creative, not fearing, they were iconoclasts sometimes, and not fearing to shock people, but to think seriously together. We need to pool our resources. I think if religious people got together, never mind the leaders, uh, but if religious people got together more, instead of sitting there saying, you know, like, I believe in the Trinity, you don't believe in the Trinity, we don't believe in the divinity of Christ, as some of these interfaith groups do, you sit around and, well, we believe in the divinity of Christ, or, well, we don't, and that's the end of the story. But, the, but if you work together, uh, side by side, looking in the same direction, then I think you discover the commonality. And I think we've got enough in common. We need uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and don't forget secularists uh, in, in, in Europe who are deeply concerned about what's going on and, 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 uh, and are not without spirituality, certainly, or deep morality and commitment to uh, justice for all. 
unless there is, uh, most of our problems are political. I'm convinced of that. They're not, it's not that uh, Islam is violent or Christianity has made the West this way. These are political problems. There is a big imbalance in the world. Uh, an imbalance of power, an imbalance of resources. Somehow these have to be addressed. Uh, I think a crucial, crucial, crucial would be finding a, a solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict, which has become symbolic to, on all sides. Uh, it, it means now more than itself a simple solution, uh, a simple, an originally secular conflict about a land, a has has escalated on all sides and become religious. You've got Christian Zionists in the United States who have, uh, are pushing the, their government to go one way. All this is not helpful. We need to find a just solution for everybody there. That's, 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 amazing. that's not something that you and I can do ourselves, obviously, but we can push our rulers for, for this in, in our voting and, and in our writing and in our thinking and our speaking and to address the inequalities, to look, let's try to learn to look at the other side. We, I have most, spent most of my time trying to help people in the West to understand what Islam is and what it isn't. But you need to understand the West a bit too. Uh, we're not all ogres. Uh, but although, and, and uh, we, and, and there's a difference, say, between Europe and the United States, too. So, an effort to understand, there's the political effort, but also, I think, a concert, concerted religious effort. Instead of endlessly finding out how our tradition is different from everybody else's and the best, to start working with, uh, across the board with other religious people to bring peace and to bring the ideals of peace and nonviolence and respect for this all uh, into the forefront of the, uh, of the conversation. So we're not always just defending our tradition against its excesses. Well, I think we need to understand these. As I told you, I mean, we practice rituals of corporal mortification in my convent. Um, you know, kissing the floor, confessing our faults. We beat ourselves over the back of the neck. And I told you, it was a complete waste of time. I, I did not find it at all spiritually helpful. Uh, this continual thrashing of my unworthy self uh, and t telling myself how dreadful I was just stuck, got me stuck in ego. Um, now, um, I, and so it's kind of group, uh, group, uh, it, this can lead to all, this, this in history there's been a lot of uh, un, um, help, unhealthy practices of group mortification. I don't think we need endlessly to wallow in our sins. I really don't. Um, I think uh, certainly we should ex have extreme regret for our wrongdoings, but I think guilt and endlessly punishing ourselves and thrashing ourselves uh, is, is simply, uh, as the Buddhists would say, unskillful. It just will not help you, um, and it leads to all kinds of un unhealthy things. Um, now, some things, however, I, I think, for example, if you think of the Shia rituals in, in places like Iran, these have gone through various transmutations in the course of time. Uh, they were, um, at one point, a demonstration against injustice, that once a year people remembered the huge injustice of the martyrdom of, of Hussein and cried out against the injustice in Muslim society. And, you know, I don't see that's a bad thing. They became slightly unhealthy later as the Shahs naturally tried to diffuse that uh, element from them and tried to say, you know, get in, get, use these rituals to get uh, fit the fever of Hussein or, or, to, or to express your sorrow for your guilt and sins. Uh, whereas uh, I think to occasionally to express in a disciplined way your anger about what is going on but then not run amok. Uh, the, the rituals must, uh, must be very carefully orchestrated to take you through the situation safely to the other side. 
so that you release tension, and a lot of people uh, who are stuck in s hopeless, ghastly situations can lose some of their frustration, but then they must be brought to the other side. It's a dangerous knife edge. Um, but basically, I would say, don't let's go in for these corporal mortifications. Uh, let's instead, we, it, it's plenty, uh, we, get, we get plenty of ecstasy by being helpful, uh, supportive, and loyal to other people. Thank you. for your questions. Uh, no, I don't think religion leads to violence. Uh, what leads to violence is usually politics and, and, the, and the human heart and greed and hatred and envy. Uh, people not doing their religion properly. Uh, so I don't, think it's, I don't think that at all. Now, I'm, I used to be a Roman Catholic. I'm not a, any, a Roman Catholic anymore, so I don't have to agree with Pope Benedict the Sixteenth uh, on, on, on what he said. And I think it's nonsense to say that Muslims can't change. If you look at Islamic history and how uh, it's developed and, uh, and it, it, it explored, then I, I, that, that puts paid to that. I always, I used to say when I was talking about my book, History of God, that uh, the Jewish people had, um, had um, given birth to the, no, first had the notion of one God. Uh, that the Chris, Greek Orthodox Christians brought that monotheism to the Gentile world and spread it, and that Islam uh, presided over God in his heyday during the Age of Faith. During the Age of Faith, I found that the Muslims were by far the most adventurous, uh, daring, innovative theologians. Um, and, um, and, and and pluralistic and uh, saying really exciting day things. And uh, then I'm afraid I said that in uh, the West, Western Christianity is presiding in some parts of the world over God's demise, God's death, because there's not, uh, we, th we, there's, there's a misunderstanding of religion, of what religion is uh, in some quarters. Now, 
I think so. I think it's nonsense to say that because it, uh, uh, all these religions change. They have to change. If you cannot be Muslims as the Prophet was in the seventh century, you're living in a different world. You can translate these ideals into you and incarnate them in your own world, but that will demand what Ibn Arabi called imagination. Uh, the ability, the imagination, which Ibn Arabi said was at the heart of the religious quest. Um, so, so I don't agree with Pope Benedict there. I, I agree that it's not much point talking about theology, especially if you're going to tell other people what they think. I really think that a, a dialogue means not saying what Muslims think and then answering them. <laughs> uh, it, it really means really listening to what people are actually saying. Um, and coming without preconceived ideas. Uh, so uh, I forget what the, what some of the other questions, I'm afraid. Uh, but, um, but no, religion doesn't lead to, oh, uh, capitalism. Well, I think this is an example of religious change. If you think that G the founder of Christianity supposedly said, give everything you have to the poor, do not build up wealth for yourselves on, uh, here on earth where moss and rust will break in and consume it, uh, but give it all away. Give it all away to the poor. Don't have a job. Live like the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Uh, now, if this religion can nourish and uh, encourage capitalism, then... Uh, you, then anything is possible, it seems to me. Any kind of religious development is possible. Um, people are often saying that it's impossible for Islam, at least they're saying that in the West, to, um, to sort of accommodate democracy. I always say if Christianity has been able to, uh, to accommodate capitalism, for Islam to, uh, to embrace democracy will be child's play. And I think we, we, the, the, you can, religions are not great monolithic blocks. Uh, you ch you uh, work with them, you respond to, to given situations, you're creative with them. Um, I'm not sure that the endorsement of capitalism was a great religious achievement, and I agree with you that the, uh, that, uh, the secularism has, in its very short history, has as many atrocities to its credit as religious bigotry. Uh, but, uh, but that's the way we are. We are flawed beings, we are greedy beings, we are selfish uh, beings, and we constantly need to make the best of ourselves uh, transcend our selfishness, and I th and our religions, properly understood, help us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have to uh, stop here because we have already gone over time. It is uh, now a tradition at the Aachen University for the special lecture series speaker to be presented uh, with a token of appreciation. Uh, of, of the token of the university's appreciation. A student is selected uh, for every special lecture to make this presentation, and the student selected for this particular lecture is Miss Anisa Barkat Ali Virji. She is a student of uh, BSCN Year 3. In her own words, she uh, belongs to Karachi. She did her intermediate from Aachan Higher Secondary School, Karachi. She completed her higher religious education in 2000 from Al-Haq Religious Education Center, and since then has been serving as a teacher in the same institution. According to her, serving humanity is a core religious belief, and the nursing profession is an extension of that belief. I will request her to kindly present you with an example. You can stand right there. You can stand right there. signifies your entry into the AKU family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ben. I also need to acknowledge the assistance of uh, certain other key contributors to this uh, lecture, including audiovisual, electronics, communication, and uh, conference secretariat. I need to acknowledge the key role of Dr. David Taylor in enabling this particular special lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, lastly, I would like to announce a special um, reflective practice workshop which is scheduled from 9 o'clock in the morning to noon tomorrow morning. This requires pre-registration and those interested can register right outside. Ms. Karen Armstrong will be uh, heading that particular workshop. Thank you very much. Uh, refreshments are right outside. <coughs>